Nice. Um, so Kate, I mean, th Kate was just like, what are people interested in? Cause she hasn't been at the panel. Um, uh, you know, people like stories about how did you do it at your university? They want to know like, what did your choices did you make? What was your implementation? You know, people are just generally interested cause it's like a lot of the people that are the first timers are like, oh, my dean asked me to do this. What do I do? And and it's just nice to be in a room of people that are like, yeah, I tried this or I did this or, you know, these choices were made. Mm -hmm. um, people just like those kind of stories. I guess a, a little bit of today, you know, in the background is like, should we think about doing something more coordinated across universities or you know, is it a place for us to fundraise? You know, the, the community college panel is definitely like, should we, we be writing grants into this space, you know, to support people? Or, you know, I'm just like, let's just hear feedback from people. Like, what is it? You know, do you want a boot camp? Do you want to come to Berkeley or San Diego? Do you want, you know, like, what's the thing that you want to make this work for you? Um, but you know this 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 panel is 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 certainly like the flavor would be like you could go to Berkeley, you go to San Diego, you go to Santa Barbara, you go to Cal Poly, and like what would you get at those places, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. I see. Okay, mm. so hence the California part. Okay. Um. Yeah, I don't know. I just like all you guys too. So it's like <laughs> yeah, it's just the same room. we like you too, Eric. <laughs> Yeah, thanks again for having us. So, yeah. yeah, it's been a great week. Um, yeah, I mean, and then like, you know, this is like the third year we're doing the workshop and each year there's like a new crop of people that are leaning in like hungry for it. So it feels it feels good that like, you know, there's still people like reaching out and interested in the content. Right. It's not like it's the third year and we're like, we've said everything. Right. And the people have heard it all and it got boring, right? Like it's yeah. people are still like, yeah, I need I need to I need to figure this out for myself, too. Yeah, it almost like you know how you have the hierarchy for the tutoring staff where they come in, they're brand new. And then after a couple of courses, they're like, I got it. I move up a level. Yeah, it's they've done that with us, too. Yes, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> We're on to <you. laughs> Like, can we replicate that? <laughs> yeah, what is it called here? They call it, um, this is like the inclusion curriculum. Oh, cascading mentorship. Cascading yeah. mentorship. Because people learn from being the mentor, right? Right. Yeah. yeah. Actually, yeah, this is this is Jamal again. Uh, you know, you just tell me when you want me to shut up. I uh, will shut up. Uh, the, the Salomon actually the, the had a good uh, talk uh, yesterday. Uh, because first of all, I went to El Camino. Second of oh. all, I... I, I, I just didn't know that you guys can, you have done this already. So <laughs> I'm going to be calling on you and say, hey, you know what? I need this help. I, I don't know what I'm doing, what I'm doing. And, uh, you know, that, that, that was good talk yesterday from you. Thank you. I really appreciate that because, yeah, I'm really hard on myself. But I, I will say this. I figured out that nobody knows what they're doing. So that's what I remind myself whenever, <laughs> whenever, <laughs> and we could have a much larger conversation about what that looks like in everyday life. But, um, but yeah, yeah, yeah. But I'm happy to work with you. And when I saw you on the, the, the I think we're on the panel, the community college panel together too. I'm really looking forward to that and, and uh, having discussions about what kind of collaboration. I have some ideas um, that we can talk about, but yeah. Yeah, I don't know if you saw, but I sent a document at like midnight last night. That's like some stuff to work on. Yeah, yeah. I, I had to teach. I, I, I teach at 7 a.m. I've ta taught at 7 a.m. this morning, uh, uh, this week until 12. So I saw it, but I didn't get to read it. But yeah, yeah. It's, all, yeah. it's all good. It's all good. Yeah. <laughs> and, and some of us sleep at night, Eric. <laughs> yeah, it's not I, I when you're like the last person to send the email. Yeah. Hey, Eric. Yeah. Oh, oh no! I just got switched between being an attendee and a presenter. Okay, never mind. So I can't share. Um, <laughs> that was just something that weird, weird that happened. Um, but yeah, yeah, it looks like I can share my slides again. Okay. <laughs> Do we need to promote anyone else? I don't. I don't think I am able to share. Yeah, me too. 
Can you hear me? All yeah. right, I'll work on that. Oh, Judith, okay, no. you're muted if you uh, where you were. I was saying I need to be promoted as well to a presenter. <laughs> I'll work on it, or, or Rachel will work on it in the background. Thank you for telling me. I think she was. Check quickly. Uh, do you hear me, guys? Yep. All right, thanks. All right, your type promoted, Judith promoted. Hi, Kate. Good morning. Anybody else? Hunter, are you in here? I believe in here. I believe I am, yeah. Aaron's in here. Russ Sol Solomon's in here. All right, I think we're all good. Uh Tentative order is I'm last. What's that? I'm last. You could be first. Oh dear. I have uh, Hunter, Aaron, Solomon. Your tie, Kate Judith, on my spreadsheet. Sure. But that's ad, ad hoc. <laughs> Are you still kind of introducing and segueing or? Yeah, sure, I'll be here. Cool. I won't remember that. I didn't write that down, so. Okay. <laughs> uh, Hunter, you're first. Yeah, I, I got that. <laughs> I need I to go get a bell or something. I need to go find my mom's like Zen chime or something. I can play it over the, the gong. There's probably an iPhone gong app. But... <laughs> yeah, but it does a meditation, you know, <laughs> ten minutes. Ten minute meditation timer. Yeah. Well, isn't it a bummer that we're not all hanging out together? Yes. yes. I don't know what it's like where you are, but it's freezing cold in Berkeley. It is chilly. Yeah. All of a sudden, Santa Barbara decided that, you know what, let's switch into the winter mode. Yeah. Yeah. I'm guessing in Fresno, it's like 10 trillion degrees. It's 100 to 102 yesterday. Today, same, I guess. Right now, it's about 80. I also wanted to say that as a follow-up from last year's panel, I went to give a talk at uh, Yurtai's Fresno State. I went to Cal Poly and visited Hunter, and I went to Santa Barbara and visited Kate. So that leaves Monterey Bay. I will get you on the list. San Diego yeah. and El Camino needs to invite me this fall. So oh, totally. Yeah. I, I didn't uh, know you did that. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. I it give a great. good talk, right? Oh yeah. Yes, it was yes. really good. <laughs> good to have you there. Writing that down now. <laughs> Kate, Kate organized a good tour, and I went around to talk to people from all different majors, which was kind of fun for me. It was like. You know the communications people need a need a stats class, and and uh, you know like different parts of campus have a, have a stats class. Um, so that was good. Harrison, can you mute your video? All right. Looks like we got a bunch of people in here, so I think we can get going. Um. Hey, Harrison, can you turn off your video? All right. Um, yeah, so the idea for today's panel is, again, similar to the panels from yesterday uh, about, uh, you know, how data science is making its place into your university. And, you know, also, almost all these people are adopting some form of a data eight type class. So those are like, you know, the two starting points. Um, but everybody has a short presentation at the end. We could discuss, uh, you know, are there ways for us to coordinate across institutions? Um, 
Today, we're going to start off with Cal Poly, who has the most complicated minor in the history of uh, <laughs> yeah. of minors uh, with Hunter Glance. Thanks. Is that showing correctly? Can you yeah, see the slides? Yeah, looks good. Okay, excellent. Thank you. You're, you're, um, you're not in present mode, though. It switched screens poorly. I apologize. I'm just going to work through it like this, I guess. But that's okay. Okay. Um, okay. So uh, thank you all for having me. Uh, yeah, it, it's, a, it's a very interesting and awesome uh, ride and experience through data science at Cal Poly. Um, by the end of this, you'll see that what I've presented is mostly a marriage of statistics and computer science and actually between those two departments and things like that. But we have efforts going on um, kind of across campus uh, from kind of business analytics and uh, um, some of the engineering uh, disciplines and things like that that are all kind of tied in. Um, but uh, yeah, I'll talk about a few different things. So the first thing I wanna start out with is that historically at Cal Poly, almost every student on campus takes uh, at least one course in introductory statistics. So depending on how you characterize data science, um, I think you know there's been some form of that at Cal Poly for a very long time for the majority of campus. Uh, and all of these statistics courses that I'm referring to are taught by the statistics department. And they're all kinds of flavors, which is kind of cool and nice. There's a uh, introductory statistics for the life sciences. There's a two quarter sequence for um, business students, um, we have a, a flavor for social sciences. Um, and so this has existed for a long time and software has been a component of almost all of these courses to varying extents and things like that. Um, and so um, this is this has kind of been around for decades, way before I was here um, and is still kind of here today. But now kind of QN data science, the revolution, if you will, um, in around 2013, these are kind of the what what I regard as the godfathers of data science at Cal Poly, I guess. Um, and the really complicated minor that that Eric referenced is what these two created. So my now department chair, Andrew Schaffner, and a very, very good colleague, Alex Dektar in the computer science department kind of got together and said, hey, data science is, is a thing. It's awesome. It's us. You know, let's put something together. And they realized that um, when they went out and kind of looked at job postings and things like that that had been emerging, it involved a lot of stuff, right? There's computer science, there's statistics, there's math, there's domain knowledge, there's there's all this stuff. And um, a minor, kind of a traditional minor at, at Cal Poly anyway, is uh, six courses, right? And this doesn't fit, at, at least as far as they were concerned, in six courses. Um, it was... It would be hard, or at least harder than maybe they wanted to um, reasonably take on at that point, to create an entirely new major or, or bachelor's degree. And so they created, I'll, I'll pan back here for a second, this kind of new curricular vehicle, um, which didn't exist, not just at Cal Poly, but to my knowledge in, in the CSU at all, called a cross-disciplinary minor. Um, we've since realized, since this has been in place since around 2013 or 2014, that minor is a terrible word for this. because this is what it involves. Um, and I apologize for the block of text, but that actually kind of helps emphasize the, <laughs> the information and the point here. Um, this is the cross-disciplinary studies minor, which as you can see involves uh, 76 or I think 80 quarter units here at Cal Poly. Um, and the idea is that this is kind of a data science program built primarily for uh, statistics and computer science majors as their kind of, or at least they were originally thought to be kind of the primary uh, maybe disciplines or, or whatever in data science. Um, and so you can see we have the full introductory year of computer science in here. We have uh, introductory stats and then we get into um, more kind of cross computing data structures, databases, um, algorithms, uh, distributed computing, uh, regression analysis and machine learning. And then there were four new courses created in data science with a data prefix. And so those were kind of new courses created. But the idea is that there's a lot of overlap here between uh, the statistics and computer science majors and this program. So this isn't you know, 76 or 80 additional units on top of their degree. 
um, it's it's overlapping. Um, and so we've kind of taken to calling it a degree plus um, because by the end of this program, they'll get their bachelor's degree in whatever their major is, plus this, which actually ends up being more than the required 180 units for their program. Um, and for the record, we have had non-computer science and stat majors uh, complete the program. We've actually had a, a political science major take this on, um, lots of math majors take this on. Uh, so it's very popular and still doable for other majors. Um, so I'll talk briefly about the kind of two big new courses that we created here. Data 401 is that kind of senior level uh, fall course that's a synthesis of everything else they've taken. Um, and this is really to prepare them for what's coming up next, which is our capstone sequence. So uh, this is kind of a mathematical foundations of machine learning and again, re-synthesis of everything that they've seen in the minor already. So databases, um, distributed computing, machine learning, all that kind of stuff. Data 451 and 452 are our two quarter kind of winter and spring capstone sequence uh, in which groups of students that we, we kind of create are matched up with a client. And this is kind of a, a real client, um, whether it be a, a faculty member at Cal Poly, we've had uh, government organizations, we've had actual businesses, we've had nonprofits, um, and tons of really cool uh, clients. So this year we had a client, uh, NASA was one of our clients. Uh, we had a client who works in kind of uh, addressing human trafficking issues and things like that. So these are these are real kind of clients with um, important and uh, meaningful collaborations where the students get kind of hands-on work and experience working with uh, a data science problem that's determined and kind of brought to them by uh, a customer. Um, and so they get a lot of really great experience with uh, communication, consulting, and things like that. Um, and so this is a nice two-quarter uh, experience. That's kind of the end of our minor, if you will, but I should stop calling it a minor, the cross-disciplinary minor, right, this big thing. Um, where we're growing at the at the current time um, is in kind of creating more courses or a course along the kind of data eight lines that Eric mentioned, uh, data science for all at Cal Poly. We were recently awarded a, an NSF grant that's kind of a partnership between us and UC Santa Barbara that we're really, really excited about. Um, with the kind of intent to foster intercampus collaborations, maybe share clients on, on these kinds of capstone projects and things like that, and then share ideas about how to implement something like a data science for all or data eight course in a quarter system, because we're still on, on quarters and stuff like that, and uh, for smaller class sizes for us. So um, Cal Poly class sizes tend not to go over around 40 students. And so um, there are some other challenges that uh, we have to work around, but it's it's a really exciting time. So two courses that um, we've kind of developed and are being polished right now are uh, Data 101. This is kind of our intro to data science or data science for all that we kind of intend for anybody on campus to be able to take. Um, and the whole idea here is how do you work with data really at a basic level? So kind of relational algebra, tabular data spreadsheets, uh, data you know visualization and wrangling. Um, and things like that. Not necessarily programming outright, but still, you know, heavy work with data in software just to get your hands on on data. Um, so a lot more kind of conceptual and statistical and things like that in this first course, followed then by something that is definitely or almost definitely going to involve some programming, um, you know, likely Jupyter notebooks or some kind of notebook interface uh, and things like that. I think data 300 for us more closely aligns with what data eight looks like. Um, at, at Berkeley, but these are still kind of being polished. And so um, that's kind of our, our current trajectory with curriculum and where we're at right now. Um, there's a lot more that I could say about, you know, where scholarship and other things like that on campus are at, but with that, I think I'll, I'll close my introduction to Cal Poly. So thank you. Awesome. Thanks, Hunter. Uh, on to Aaron. OK, great. Let's see if this works. Sorry, I hung up instead of <laughs> just stopping. That's one way to stop sharing. I didn't mean to do that. Sorry. <laughs> but thank you very much. OK, Thanks, we, can, we can see my slides. It's coming. There it is. Yep. OK, perfect. All right. 
Can you pronounce that first word? Because I've always wondered. Killing me. Uh, so it's the C is a G and the G is silent. Uh, so, uh, so it would be Haligyolu. Um, and so th this, uh, actually, that's a, that's a nice intro to this. Um, uh, so at UCSD, we we were lucky enough. Uh, so Taner uh, Haligyolu is a, uh, um, was one of the first or the first paid employee at Facebook. Um, and he uh, was all, is also a UCSD alum um, from the, the CS department. And he uh, gave a gift of about somewhere around $75 million to, to start uh, this data science institute. Um, and so we are in a very unusual position um, of being awash in money um, and uh, awash in ambition. Um, so you will s see, uh, you know, a lot of, let's see, um, you know, a lot of initiatives here um, that we're working on and, and it requires um, a lot of choices um, as well. And so I, I just want to share some of these with you. Um, even even though we are awash in money and ambition, we're actually we're, we've been quite small, um, although we are growing um, very quickly. So just two years ago, uh, the only uh, dedicated faculty in uh, HDSI and our Data Science Institute actually were myself and one colleague. Uh, and in fall, we'll actually have close to 20 uh, with some non-zero appointment in our uh, um, in our department or division. Um, so we have a major. Um, this major actually has about uh, 750 students. We just graduated our first class this year of 80 students, and next year we're planning on graduating about 250. Um, so we're actually have become the 10th largest major on campus already, so there, there, there's a lot of uh, buzz, you know, around data science at UCSD. Uh, we have about 20 courses uh, within our data science department, like with a DSC course code, um, including seven lower division and uh, nine core upper division, uh, the rest being electives. Okay, um, so I just kind of wanted to put uh, put our department and and the sort of like choices we've made in building a major in the in the context. Um, so I kind of uh, took the you know much maligned data science Venn diagram um, and put them on axes because I think that this is a little more uh, a better way of thinking about at least how you dedicate your uh, finite number of units uh, that you can make students take um, along. You know, CS, math, stats, and then, um, you know, domain, uh, domain, domain focuses. And the, uh, the sort of places that you can, uh, so, so where you lie in, you know, in these axes, right, like, um, you know, depends on what you want to do. And so a lot of people here, uh, you know, you might just be considering uh, how you can, expose students in, for example, an existing major like poli sci or econ, right, to, to more computational skills um, or expose them to data science. Uh, and others, right, uh, might be actually building up an entire major. Um, and so the two sort of uh, uh, paradigms for majors that, I, that I've seen uh, have been the two bullets here, which are that you can either select courses from different departments, kind of bootstrap a major as much as you can uh, from, from existing courses, and really let students kind of find their focus early um, and, uh, you know, find which portion of that Venn diagram they want to spend most of their time on. Um, and, or you can actually make students take a very broad base of data science classes and try to like, uh, you know, demand as much mastery as possible from in all areas of the Venn diagram. And there, there are, there, 
there are advantages and disadvantages of both of them. Um, and for better or for worse, UCSD has, has tried to get students to, you know, get this really broad base uh, of foundational data science classes. Um, okay, so what does our major look like? Uh, we require uh, students to take a lot of courses. Um, so, and in some sense, really, it's it's we've almost uh, created a double major. Tried to tried to like weave a double major into one. Um, and so, so our major is put together as such. We have these three. Uh, we have three sort of I like to call them holistic data science courses, which I uh, or touch points, uh, which I'll talk about more uh, in, on the next slide. Um, but we have sort of. Uh, two actually intro courses to data science. One of them is a bit like data eight. Um, uh, another one is a little more contextual and less hands-on. Um, and then students embark on their uh, learning a bit of computer science algorithms, data structures, along with uh, intro to modeling and uh, um, a computational theory. Um, and these are within the data science, uh, you know, data science department. Uh, then we have another intermediate touch point, um, which I call the practice of data science, uh, where they get to apply this, the computational, uh, sorry, the, the, the computer science courses and, and the, the theory courses uh, sort of to, to real world problems. And then they kind of branch off into uh, upper division. And our upper division sequence uh, core core courses uh, consist mostly of um, so data data management um, stuff like relational databases uh, parallel processing um, and so they have three courses there these are quarter courses uh, three machine learning courses uh, machine learning theory as well as kind of applied machine learning data mining um, and three stats courses and actually all of these used to live in their respective departments. Um, in either CS or in math, but we have um, we ha we have created our own now um, so that they can be a bit more integrated um, and complement each other better. Um, and then finally, um, at the end of it, every every major um, in their senior year has to take a capstone sequence, uh, which is a two quarter long uh, project based uh, sequence. So in total, it's 112 units uh, with 52 lower division and 60 upper division. Um, oh, and I should say, and I'll talk about it more as well, um, is alongside all of this, students are taking uh, domain elect required domain electives where they do have flexibility in kind of uh, applying data science to uh, areas that interest them. Okay, so what are these? Uh, the holistic data science courses. Um, so these are four major courses uh, that really try to emphasize, you know, bring together uh, various, uh, all the various disparate areas of data science into, you know, one course where you, where you see the connections between them, okay? Um, and really, uh, the overarching theme in all of them is that they emphasize critical reasoning about how data is created and um, how that affects your analyses and how you deal with them. Um, so to call out specific, uh, a few specific uh, courses here, we, ha we do have our own uh, data eight. So, so originally for, we were uh, um, teaching our own data eight class uh, just as Berkeley does, um, but we've now sort of added our own flourishes. Um, and uh, we actually, instead of using the data science module, we use uh, a um, sort of restricted version of Pandas um, that is open source and uh, people are welcome to use and it's linked in these slides. Um, uh, the practice of data science is, I like to call it data eight meets messy data. I mean, it really takes on the spirit of data eight that we really like uh, at UCSD um, and uh, allows students to sort of 
up their game um, from the same perspective and uh, you know apply the things that they've been learning um, in their first two years uh, to sort of real problems in real world data sets. And then the last um, is, is the capstone sequence, uh, which is uh, varied in, you know, uh, you know, with 250 students doing projects uh, is sort of a, an interesting version of, uh, um, you know, a scaled project course uh, that allows, I like to think, a surprising amount of uh, individual um, initiative in, in what students can actually study, but also maintaining, uh, you know, kind of strict guidelines. Um, for our domain tracks, uh, we allow students to pick any four domain tracks uh, of these domain tracks that we uh, um, have in the major, which, which were sort of uh, developed to uh, align sort of with industry a bit, uh, different roles that do and notions that uh, an undergraduate data science major uh, uh, might be. And uh, from the academic perspective, it's meant to uh, expose students to how data was created um, and how data is reasoned about. So they get to choose uh, um, domain tracks from the natural sciences, social sciences, uh, business econometrics, uh, or uh, various areas of, of machine learning. But the important part there is that it has to be on a, a specific uh, data type and kind of a more specific problem. Okay, last, in, in building up these, uh, you know, this major, uh, we, we have experienced some pain points that I would love to talk about. Um, and these are kind of the big ones. Um, so it's really hard to clearly, you need a lot of faculty to actually staff so many of your own courses. Um, but in our case, it was just as hard the, the, the motivation for us actually staffing all of these courses was uh, that it's even harder to get our own majors into uh, existing CS courses. Uh, the uh, creating all of these courses though, uh, really makes transferability or articulate articulation of community colleges and other colleges really difficult. Um, and so I really look forward to uh, the panel on community colleges and data science and community colleges this afternoon. Um, of course, there's this trade off of demanding this broad foundation uh, from our majors that it, it allows less time for them to kind of specialize into one specific area, which is unfortunate. Um, and then last is, is just this sort of intricate choreography to kind of get a double major into one major uh, is, it has been a bit difficult to implement. Um, and, and of course, you know, uh, coordinating faculty is often like herding cats. Um, but I think that, that um, we, we have actually had a, a, a good amount of success and able to uh, get a successful uh, major design like this up. So, thanks. Thanks, Aaron. And uh, for those of you out there listening who aren't in California, it might be interesting for you to know that there are just this huge number of students that go between institutions over the course of their time. Like UC Berkeley, I think it's something like between, it's something around 30% of the graduates at UC Berkeley are coming from two years. Aaron, do you know like a number for San Diego? You're muted. <laughs> I'm sorry, I just lost audio. What's the number that you want? Oh, I don't know. Do you know like how many transfers graduate from San Diego? Oh, uh, so we just started, um, we got our first official uh, batch of transfers actually this last year and we're still just re restricted yeah. to no, 30. I, I meant just generally like across. Oh. It's oh. a big number though, it's like thousands. Oh, yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, we are supposed to, I think, about, a, we're supposed to reserve about, uh, in, in steady state, about a quarter of our 
graduates. Sure, 25 percent, something like yeah. that. All right, thank you. And on to uh, Russell, who could talk, I mean, Solomon, who can talk about uh, his side of it. Great. Uh, welcome. Uh, good to be here, everybody. Let me share my slides. Uh, there we go. And so hopefully you can see what I'm seeing. Looks good. Great. Okay, um, so my name is Solomon Russell. I'm a professor at El Camino College. Uh, El Camino is a two-year college in Los Angeles County. Uh, we're about 10 minutes south of LAX. Um, we're pretty, uh, we serve a pretty diverse community. So uh, some of the areas that are inside of the El Camino uh, Community College District include Manhattan Beach, Redondo Beach, uh, Hermosa Beach, but then we also include areas of Inglewood and Carson. So those are really different uh, communities. So we uh, do have a diverse uh, group of students uh, in terms of uh, uh, ethnicity, but also experiences. Um, so where am I? The way that we have uh, computer science set up and mathematics is in one division. So in this mathematics division, uh, there are three departments. There's math, computer science, and engineering. Um, I don't know about many other community colleges, but that's the way that we kind of have things working uh, right here. Um, we are also in community colleges uh, living in a new world of AB 705. So I'm not sure if, if this has been talked about during the conference, but uh, this has really been a sea change um, for how community colleges place students in their intro math and English classes. In a nutshell, um, students are now required to be in a uh, have a pathway to being in a transfer level math or english class inside of a year so this really stops the the cycle hopefully it'll stop the cycle of students being stuck in remedial math so everything that we're doing um in mathematics in the mathematics division um is really with this sea change happening in the background so um there's a lot of different views on AB 705, depending on who you talk about uh, it with. So what brought us to data science? So we're a little different from uh, some of the presentations uh, that have uh, already come, and I'm sure some that are to follow. We have not offered a data science program yet, um, but we are in the process and um, we have things pretty much ready to go. So where we how we got here. So in 2017, uh, we started teaching a CS class based on Cal CS10. So this is the beauty and joy of computing. It's a really popular class, which is really meant to get students and underrepresented groups into computing, right? So they've done great work in terms of getting more women into, uh, into uh, that class. Um, I think a couple of years ago, they actually had more women enrolled than men, which is kind of unheard of in most uh, uh, computer science programs. Um, so we started teaching that in 2017. I was in a meeting also with a NSF program officer, I think in 2018. And at the end, she was just given a state of computer science around the nation. And she said two programs that were huge uh, in growth were cybersecurity and, and data science. And that really kind of connected with the next thing on the slide, which is I kept seeing this thing about data eight offered in CS10. Right. So there were, you know, I was I was teaching this class and this is a, a survey class. So it's really, really basic, um, but it's a really good class. Um, and I kept seeing like these tie ins to data eight. And I said, well, this looks like it might be a sister class of uh, CS10. And because I really believe in a lot of the efforts and the thought behind CS10, I started to check this out. Um, so when I started to uh, research it more um, at a math division meeting, I just basically got up at the end of the meeting, asked the dean, and I said, hey, I'm really interested in this data science thing. Um, I've been hearing about it a lot, um, but I haven't taken statistics in 20 years, um, so I would really like uh, to collaborate with someone on that. Um, and someone did collaborate with me. Um, so I had already had a brown bag planned. So even though I am know nothing of data science, um, I 
planned a brown bag uh, with Alice Martinez, the, the faculty member from El Camino. Um, and um, we actually had a student um, that had taken, not one of our students, but of a professor, his daughter, she had taken the Data 8 course that previous semester. So she came in um, and she gave a presentation and she just talked about her experience. She brought up her, her exams. Um, and in that uh, presentation, we actually had, um, we had faculty members from math and we also had students. The interesting thing about that meeting is one of the students in my advanced programming uh, C++ class, um, he was transferring, he was going to transfer to uh, UCLA. And then after that presentation, um, he said to me, you know, he had a wife and a kid. He has a wife and a kid. And uh, he said that um, I'm actually going to go to Berkeley now after that presentation, just from seeing um, just the, the really basic things that we talked about and the stuff that was happening. Um, one of the things that that really connected for me, um, we, we later on did a presentation at a breakout session for the whole college campus. So uh, here, all faculty members were able to um, able to come and see. And there was a lot of interest, almost too much interest. We had uh, professors asking for modules um, already, like, hey, I want to start teaching like uh, this as a section of my class. And I had to tell them, like, hey, I don't even I, I'm, I'm, you know, don't even know much about the subject yet. I'm still learning myself. One thing that was really useful is the very first, um, I think, thing that they do in Data 8, at least on the online version that's up, is they put up this really powerful visualization of uh, little women. And um, just based on that presentation, I got a lot of faculty members um, um, coming back and saying that was really powerful, being able to visualize and have a story. And that's the thing that I love about data science. It's, um, you know, I, I had to teach economics once um, and I had never taken a class and I loved it because it was like math and a story. And when I realized that this was like math, a story and computer science, that's when I, I just really, uh, uh, really got connected to these efforts. All right. Um, so where we are now, uh, so we have two classes that are approved for uh, this next coming uh, school year. Um, the first is uh, CS8, <laughs> Foundations of Data Science. Uh, we decided to just keep the same name, and obviously this is um, modeled after UC Berkeley's uh, Data 8 course. Um, and we also, this is one of the things that is great about data science is that there's a lot of people thinking about it and there's a lot of efforts that may be happening and this is what I found out um, that you don't even necessarily know about. Uh, there was independent of me looking into these things, someone at our university, at our college, sorry, um, that had already started working on a course um, called Data Driven Persuasion. Um, and it's a course modeled after UC Santa Barbara's uh, Communications 87 course, uh, as the professor told me. So we already have two courses. That course is going to be taught in, um, in fall of this coming uh, uh, school year. And uh, another thing, as we've started to uh, tell some of our advisory board members about um, our efforts, uh, we've gotten great, um, great feedback. Um, from some of the CSUs, particularly Dominguez Hills, uh, which we found out they have a uh, some type of data science minor, or maybe they call it analytics in some way, but it's really closely related. And some of the companies uh, that have joined our advisory board, some um, um, well-known companies that have talked about internships, and really what they are is they're data companies, right? And uh, when we said that we were going to offer this course, uh, they became very, very interested in our students. So that was really great to see. Um, one thing that I also started to put together a maybe about a month ago is because we were talking and uh, to different people, one off kind of conversations and everybody's interested in this. Um, I said we need a plan. Um, so I put together a document. And I got input from the dean and other people that are interested, just putting together kind of like a, a plan that we have for the school, um, explaining what data science is, listing what courses we have, um, how these courses might actually be related to courses at other schools uh, like Berkeley, um, a potential timeline, like a timeline that I want to start thinking about um, 
what is the next course after CS8 for us? Um, Cause I don't want to wait until we taught it a couple times to start having those conversations and to see what course is doable when we start to look at what partners that we have. Like if we want to send students to um, Cal, you know, uh, UC San Diego, if we want to send them to Poly, if we want to send them to Berkeley, what uh, information do they need to know in order to be, um, to be able to hit the ground running beyond data eight? Um, and then I did just a survey, a really quick survey of all the courses that I could find in high schools. So in high schools here in L.A., there's an intro to data science class out of UCLA, um, UCLA Center X. And I used to do some work with them, um, and that was a sister program. And then they are putting data science into high schools. And we found out in high school that's a mile away um, is doing a data science unit in their Algebra 2 class. Um, there are a number of associates of degrees in data science, and we looked at some of the local universities and colleges around us to see just what's the lay of the land. And we also looked at um, uh, put in their pro, pro, for-profit uh, companies just to see how much they, <laughs> they charge for these, um, uh, um, these classes and where we can actually help students. Um, so some of the feedback that I got from an experienced student. So this is a student who's a little bit more mature than our typical uh, student at El Camino. He had run actually a marketing company um, for a couple years. Um, and he was really, he is a big resource in how we think about this. And some of the feedback, and I'll talk about this more on the community college uh, panel later on, is that he contacted half a dozen community colleges over the last couple of years. And not only did he not get information, but he kind of got disinformation in some ways. So um, faculty members who are kind of the first uh, point of contact for a lot of students didn't really know how to communicate um, what they had to offer. Um, and he, he told me one story where he asked about data science and a professor said, yeah, we do have data science program. We have data structures, right, which is related, but uh, not necessarily what the student was looking for. Um, he also uh, uh, let us know that um, he's talked to a lot of uh, different uh, uh, administrators at schools and he's found that like the picture with um, like the description with uh, little women that people think about data science when you're explaining it to them and giving them an elevated pitch through a narrative, right? So people automatically go to a narrative. Uh, he talked to the president of one school who started talking about a uh, how from Space Odyssey. And that was the way that she started to like just describe it and think about it. And um, he actually had to go to Berkeley this past summer to take the course that he wanted because it wasn't here in LA. So when he heard about our efforts, he said, this is great. This is the course I, I was looking for, but I had to travel to uh, uh, Berkeley to take. So where are we going? So we're really starting to think about uh, a certificate or associate's degree. So I'm, uh, I hope to have some meetings with our um, uh, campus counselors to see um, an 18 unit certificate, um, what courses we have that we can put towards that, and maybe what courses do we need to develop for that. And that's a conversation that obviously needs to be uh, greater. Um, with other people. Um, developing the next course after Data 8, which I've talked about, um, we're actually, uh, we just got a uh, grant through the California Learning Lab um, just a, a month ago, uh, and we're partnering, Berkeley's the lead institution, uh, Cal State Long Beach is uh, also uh, working with us um, on developing paradigm-based uh, question generators for Python, and into that grant we wrote in uh, Data 8 um, that we, we use those questions. Um, as I've gone to a couple of uh, presentations here, um, and the panel uh, yesterday was really useful in, um, in understanding the idea that a lot of students don't necessarily have issues with the programming part. They have more issues with maybe uh, the learning statistics part that comes after that, um, that maybe um, we can start thinking, I can start thinking about um, making paradigm-based question generators that auto-generate, which allow people to take maybe exams at different times with independent questions, but still the same kind of paradigm. Um, maybe we can start to apply that even more to data eight. Um, this is work that was based off of UC, uh, um, I'm sorry, University of Illinois Ur Ur Urbana-Champaign, um, some work that they've done. And uh, we're going to be teaching data eight in spring of 2021. I didn't want to teach it the first time um, in an online environment, although I'm starting to think I'll probably have to teach it um, in 2021 in that environment um, with Alice Martinez. 
Martinez, um, who I'm working with. So uh, that's pretty much it for me. Trying to unmute. Wow, Solomon, you're amazing. Uh, if you ever want to a job at Berkeley, just you know. Come on up. <laughs> Thanks, I appreciate it. Um, yeah, uh, lots to talk about here. Lots to engage on for sure. Um, and I like your little case study stories of like you know different pathways and different students. It's really helpful to think about those those individual students. Um, next up, we have Yurtai from CSU Fresno. Hello. Uh, thank you. Uh, let me share my screen quickly. And in the wrong place. Oh, it's not coming up. Uh, it's uh... it's now presenting. Yes, I was gonna show the uh, the uh, Google slides. Uh... It's asking me either, either PowerPoint or. Uh, oh, sorry, uh, I got it then. Um, no, no. It's not working. Uh, uh, let, let me. Uh, Can you let press me, the uh, share button? Yes, uh, I did it, but uh, oh, oh. Uh, all right, so it's not working. All right. All do, right. do you want to like quit? And all right, here we go. It's on. Good. All right. All right. So uh, uh, thank you for having me. My name is uh, Yuri Tait, and I um, I will be talking about the data eight. Uh, course here at the Fresno State. Uh, uh, so a little bit about me. I'm from the Department of Information Systems uh, and Decision Sciences, uh, which is uh, uh, hosted at the School of Business. And like, uh, unlike most of you, I'm not from uh, computer science or, uh, or uh, you know, math and stat. But uh, to get started with uh, last year, it was me. I attended the uh, first workshop and then like everyone, uh, I got very excited about the uh, initiatives, especially the RIAT. And then I, I, for the whole year, I went uh, this journey to, to start this course here at the Fresno State. So the first course will be starting this fall. Uh, all right, so a uh, little bit about the Fresno. We are uh, one of the uh, campus of uh, 23 CSU system, about 24,000 students. Uh, and we are located in agricultural region of Central California, which is about three hours uh, away from uh, San Francisco and Bay Area. And we are designated as uh, uh, both Hispanic serving institution and the uh, Asian American, Native American, Pacific Islander serving institution. Um, more than 60% of the students uh, here at the Fresno are uh, first generation students. Uh, with this, we are highly ranked for social mobility, which means you know, the, the social status of students when they graduate uh, there is a huge gap, so that's uh, that's we are proud of. Um, but the, the one thing why I said is that uh, because uh, uh, we have we are in the middle of the agricultural region, 
And most of the students are coming from the, uh, the, the background whose parents, you know, did not go to college. And uh, <clears throat> there is a this uh, statistic that um, all most of the about seventy percent of the graduates also stay in the region as well. They don't go or move out from the region. So that's also uh, uh, one thing to consider. All right, so uh, uh, data eight here. Now, uh, we, we don't, uh, as of right now, we don't have a science major. Um, we have an analytics major at the uh, School of Business. Um, uh, there is a data science minor at the math and stat department, but there is no course uh, similar to data eight at Berkeley that uh, everyone can take take the course. All the majors like data analytics and the data science minor, they are within their uh, majors and unit programs. Most of the students can uh, cannot take uh, the courses in those. Uh, those majors. So that's uh, that's why uh, we created this, uh, you know, data eight course, foundation of data science. The again, the uh, goal is very similar to uh, to UC Berkeley. That uh, it is uh, it is open to every student across the campus. Uh, there is no uh, a prerequisite, uh, but uh, only the math uh, readiness category one and two. That's the most recent uh, CSU uh, system wise category for the freshman students. And also, uh, we were able to designate this course as uh, GE uh, general education uh, course under the uh, uh, category of B4, which is which is the uh, quantitative reasoning, uh, which is basically all the the math uh, courses uh, uh, come in now. So because it's a GE lower level, again, the uh, the uh, mo mostly the freshmen and the uh, you know second year students uh, would be expected to take this class. Uh, now uh, with this pandemic, uh, I it's going online now. I. <laughs> We expect some uh, some challenges. Um, now, uh, like uh, if you, I mean, uh, like the UC Berkeley design, uh, David has discussed uh, before and uh, last year as well. Uh, when when they started, right, uh, Eric? When uh, when the data eight started. Uh, they did not want to involve any, yeah, any, you know, uh, interdepartmental or college-wise, uh, uh, you know, politics. They just started this awesome course and uh, let the students take it, uh, and then uh, let the course speak uh, itself, and then then they will have discussion later on if the other majors or programs wanted to take this course as a requirement or a substitute course for for their um, uh, you know majors and programs that's what uh, that's what we wanted to do here so we did not uh, ask any uh, any uh, college or program uh, to take this course yet and they just opened the course uh, so, which means uh, some, uh, I would say, if it's considered a challenge, uh, but uh, these existing courses, such as the STEM, even the business program, they require their own specific G course at the moment. It's then, our course, this data eight, uh, which we call uh, this. Exactly the same foundation of data science uh, is in that category, but it's not required by any of the majors. Uh, uh, this this means uh, the students in uh, some like STEM and engineering or business, 
they will only take this course if they are interested in taking the course and uh, their GE requirement will go up. Uh, now, I mean, they will be taking more courses than the required GE uh, credits. Uh, but there are other majors, uh, especially in uh, School of uh, uh, Social Science or uh, School of Public Health. Uh, in these majors and programs, uh, only the, the requirement for GE under uh, B4 is that they should take uh, one course. They, they can select the one course among this uh, uh, GE category. Uh, so we are expecting uh, at the moment we are expecting because we are in the midst of the pandemic and you know uh, uh, students might not hear the uh, the course so we are expecting uh, enrollments from uh, from majority of uh, non-stem students uh, so that's our current expectation uh, and uh, again, as I said, it's uh, with this uh, everything going virtual and online. Uh, it's uh, right now it's a little bit harder to promote the class. Uh, uh, we have uh, what we call the registration days. We call it bug days, uh, uh, and the uh, they, they are still going on um, for the freshmen and uh, transfer students. I think transfer students going to happen uh, next uh, month. Uh, so right now our intention is to open two sections about uh, 40 students each, so about 80 students. Uh, and they, uh, we want to make it uh, like hopefully right there. We want to uh, uh, make it successful so that the uh, before discussing all the, uh, you know, uh, all the requirement and the, uh, the uh, department uh, uh, issues and politics, uh, we, we would like to, you know, uh, make this course speak to itself. So that's our, our, our uh, uh, current uh, objective, uh, if I may say. All right, so uh, that's that's all I have. Uh, thank you, Eric. I think I was supposed to go next, but if Judy is ready, then we can swap. Yeah, thanks, Yurtai. I just wanted to say, learning about this, like the politics of who gets to offer the GE course and and uh, where those people are in the university and which department they belong to. And some departments depend on the enrollments from the GE courses. Um, it's really important uh, to work through that. I mean, it's a, such a great place for a data eight course to be is in that sort of like, could be for the sociology or the psychology majors too, right? Like we would love it. Uh, yes. If that was that the question. Yes, yeah, so we, we were able to, we were lucky that uh, it was approved at the last meeting of the GE committee. So <laughs> they, we, we, so we, got, we got lucky, yeah. This is the thing where like, your, your tie is gonna do the battle and then we're gonna document it and then everyone else can be like, look, Fresno State approved it. So anyways, we're all, we're all working in this community of practice together. Um, who's going next, Kate or Judith? Judith, do you have slides? Um, I do, but someone just knocked at my door. Okay. I, <laughs> so if I'll you don't go mind ahead. going next. Don't worry. Yes. Hi. Uh, so I am uh, Yekaterina Haritonova. I go by Kate. I am a teaching assistant professor at UC Santa Barbara. Um, I'm seeing that my slides are not showing up. It's a PDF through the preview, so I'm not, I'm just going to be talking. So, um, without visuals i will Your, hold on your tie did you figure out anything important on how to present the slides 
Keith has it in the Google Docs though, and oh. mine is not in the browser. So I, I, I've been I've been trying to look at the share menu and tweak it. And it's, okay, sorry. So I'll send the slides to you, and you can post them for people to use as a reference. I will drop one link. Um, this is the link to the data science initiative at UCSB. We're trying to use it as sort of a hub where we can send people to. Um, you can see who are the people who are involved and um, sort of the research the courses that we have listed. But what I'll do is I'll um, present it from the perspective of my journey. Um, right now, UC Santa Barbara does not have a data science major. But last year, the Department of Probability and Statistics renamed themselves to be Applied Statistics and Data Science. Um, so in a way, that department was like, well, we're already doing this, so we might as well have it as part of our name, which creates a little bit of confusion for students. And um, the question comes up, well, how is the new data science major supposed to be different from what already ha is happening in that department? And the focus of the major is supposed to be such that students get one third of their courses from the statistics department, one third of their courses from the computer science department, and one third of the courses is a domain um, focus that they choose. And they have an option from social scientists, humanities, and environmental studies. These are the areas, the disciplines at UCSB that are willing to jump in on this initiative, have their students kind of switch to this direction and offer the courses that are specific um, and focused on the data part of it. So for me, I didn't know any of this. I joined UCSB two years ago. I was finishing a visiting professor position at Harvey Mod, and in the summer transitioning from Harvey Mod to UCSB, there was a very first workshop held at Berkeley um, and uh, somebody at UCSB said, well, we're thinking about this. You're a new faculty. You have choices for which classes you teach. How about you go to this workshop and learn what Berkeley is doing? Um, I love I'm a computer scientist by training and uh, I love computer science specifically because it is so applicable to other fields. So I jumped in feet first, uh, went through this workshop. And um, somehow we still are not sure how this happened, but in my very first year as a faculty transitioning from a classroom of about 20, 25 students to a classroom of 100 plus students, I was tasked with teaching this data aid like course for the first time at my institution uh, without anybody knowing how to do this. So I'm extremely grateful to the faculty at UCSD who said we've done this a couple of times. Um, and why is it that I was panicking other than the fact that I'm creating a brand new course at a new institution? It was because Berkeley is on a semester system, which means that they have 16 weeks to guide their students through this material and the awesome textbook that they have. I had 10 weeks of a quarter to try to figure out how do I do this? Do I cram it? If, do I throw things out? And if I throw things out, what do I throw out? Because it looked very tightly woven together. And if you pull one puzzle piece, everything else might not really fit into it. Um, and so that very first course, I'm sort of, I'm a walking testament for those of you who are like, my dean, my chair, my whoever told me I have to teach it. And now, you know, I'm thrown into it. Is it doable? I'm a walking example that, yes, it is possible. Uh, you will survive. You will, um, you know, form really good interesting relationship with your students as you explain that you we're all in this together and we're learning. Um, and if any of you are teaching it this fall um, and you're teaching it remotely, I join my club because that's exactly what I'm doing. And I feel like it doesn't matter that I taught data eight um, two times before. I'm now like in this new uncharted territory. How do I do this remotely over Zoom with these Jupyter notebooks? Um, I did have a little bit of practice because we are teaching data 100 like course and we taught it last year and I just finished teaching it this quarter and it was remote for us. 
So I do know that it is possible to do debugging with Jupyter Notebooks over Zoom uh, remotely with students with very bad internet connections. So uh, we survived that and there is hope for the fall. Um, so so that's, that's kind of what happened. I got um, this course that I had to birth and create and shape and uh, figure out what it's like. Um, one of the interesting things that um, happens at UCSB is Department of Computer Science is in the College of Engineering and Department of Probability and Statistics is in the College of uh, Letters and Sciences. Uh, sciences, yes, College of Lit LNS. And um, the fact that they're in two different colleges makes it a nightmare times two to try to do something where students from either major can count courses from something else. Um, and the major that spans different colleges is not heard of. It actually requires changes on the UC level system, apparently. So while all of this is going through and is happening, we wanted to pilot this course or the set of courses to say that, yes, it's possible. Yes, it's doable and that students are actually interested and it is possible to do. So we temporarily parked it um, in a um, letter, College of Letter of Sciences in the um, course designation called INT, inter Interdisciplinary, which is usually a course uh, label that is given to seminars. It's typically reserved for like experience for first year students, which ended up being actually really, really lucky because something that we found out is there's a certain stigma if a course is labeled a CS course or it's a statistic course, it naturally draws or repels students. For me, because it was an interdisciplinary course, I got students, I kid you not, I looked at the list of majors, over 20 different majors. I had biology, biochemistry, Chicano studies, literature, physics, you name it. Um, one of the th draws was the fact that there were no prerequisites. And the first time I taught it, I was new to UCSB, so I said, it's a freshman only class. And the freshman only class had an interesting side effect, is apparently poor freshmen due to the registration structure. By the time they get to register, everything else is full. So to have a class into which juniors and seniors couldn't get into, that was reserved specifically for them, was a blessing. So it was really, really good and we were learning together. Um, we took a lot of, so I basically took the modules from Berkeley and I thank everybody who developed them. It was really, really helpful. One of the things that we noticed, it's very Berkeley specific. So you learn about the um, cafes, you learn about the dorms, you learn about the sports. And as I was walking through the materials, thankfully I had undergraduate tutors who were helpers. We said, well, wait a minute, you know, UC is UC, this is UC Berkeley, let's now modify it to UCSB. So, you know, we changed the sports, we changed the cafes. And this is actually something that I'm really hoping this community will do because the textbook and the layout and the breakdown of modules is really great, right? There is a certain flow. And all of us at some point will modify one or two labs, one or two assignments, one or two activities, but they all kind of follow the same progression. So if a new person comes in and they're like, oh, how can I change this? There is this wealth of materials that lives everywhere else. And if we can maybe bring it together, and that was the session at 60 that I wanted to start, because uh, you computer science education, that didn't happen this year, but I'm on it. So if you're interested in it, if you have experience, do contact me because I really want to start it because that was my, my situation because I was like, you know, I need more examples for probability, but I don't like, the whole focus is on data and all of the examples sometimes use dice and cards and it gets old and people, students don't see how it ties into the real world. I'm like, somebody must have done this. So, so that's what we were doing. We were modifying it and it's interesting for me because I had to 
decide how I'm going to depart from the 16 week schedule. And what happens is the first time I was following the book and the book, by the time the week eight and 10 comes around, uh, goes that it goes into hypothesis testing. So I went with this, but without, you know, prerequisites of distribution and knowing how to analyze things, it was really challenging to teach them hypothesis testing. So the second time, which was last year when I taught it, I went with the central limit theorem and doing the correlation. And that was easier, but um, Berkeley's materials, I think, took a little more of a a mathematical approach of like this is how you would derive this as opposed to like this is what the visual thing is so for me this fall will be the third time I'm teaching this class I'm going to be changing it yet again not just because it's going to be remote but also because I need to figure out what is the ending point of that class the way we're structuring the major is we're going to have that course that is open for everybody then it would lead in, so it, that is data one. Then it would be data two, which is the course that kind of takes the training wheels off of the pandas and puts them onto the real pandas, kind of bridges the gap between those, gives them more rigor for like, these were the concepts that you learn about. This is how it looks in, in the formula form. Then gets them into the advanced data science, data science three course that is close to data 100, only a lot more machine learning, a lot more of the um, harder statistics. And then they're ready to um, go into the capsi capstone sequence. So that is part of what we're um, developing with Cal Poly as well as part of the grant, having the real world projects. At the same time, those students are taking some of the required computer science courses, some of the required statistics courses like probability and statistics, all of this. So that's kind of the common background that they have. It's um, the big pr problem we're running into is that the Courses are very, very impacted in both departments. Um, and so trying to ensure that it doesn't take away the seats from the majors who need it, trying to figure out how we're going to have enough faculty, trying to figure out how we can cross list courses because the numbering is different. So those are all of the challenges that I was unaware of uh, blissfully teaching uh, or just signing up myself for teaching it for the first time. Um, but it's been hugely helpful to have that really good starting point. Students love the fact that the textbook was online, that it had these interactive examples there. Um, teaching with Jupyter Notebook freed up the headache of the installation. And I think Ernesto is going to be talking about how we implemented it at UCSB. Your type benefited a little bit from seeing how to set this up. So. Um, we know that it is a more or less reproducible process. So um, huge thank you for you guys to making to making it available to us. Yeah. Um, so that's kind of my journey. And I um, I know that when I was here at this uh, workshop the first time and the second time, I was like, oh, yeah, it all sounds great, you know. And then you start teaching it and it's like, oh, but who do I ask or how do I do this? I do tell you that I'm on the Slack channel. We are monitoring it. I have seen activity there. So let's use that as a platform because sometimes I'm just like, the student asked this question and I don't know how to answer. I'm not a statistician and my statistics faculty are busy. So what do I do? So let's use that as a common platform. Um, I'm... Yay. You are so great. I couldn't like have written that punchline any better. You're like amazing. I know, and I, if there's I somebody know. that's like a dean that we can write to that you should be like permanently hired as like, you know, a permanent lecturer, tell us who that person is and we're all going to write lecture, write letters oh, to that, that dean. Awesome. Like, <laughs> yeah, you, there are you, lots you, of really, really good people. So I'm I'm excited. I think the fact that they allowed us to do um, co-teaching that that's a whole other point I didn't touch up on yes. because it was I it was moved to data 100 um, because they're like you know data eight you should be able to do by yourself but in data 100 oh my gosh it was a lifesaver to have somebody from the statistics department and students love the fact that we had different views and opinions you know we were talking about 
um, regression and I'm calling them weights and he talks about coefficients and you know there's like this discussion about how and why it is that it is this way that you know this is, is neural networks perspective this is you know more of an equation perspective and so so it was very very helpful and um i think the fact that berkeley has done it and it was a model was gave us a little more punch for being like we have to do this especially as we're developing it so the more we share of what is it that we're doing and how it's working in another institution yeah. i think um yeah hunter and alex brought up the exact same thing in the in the cal poly case and you know there's a there's a horrible tyranny of the math where like you know as far as like professors getting credit hours for doing something it's just not so great when you're like trying to get two people to share a class the way the Ber berkeley model is currently working is you just scale the class up to maximum so then you're like well we're teaching a thousand students so <laughs> um which i wouldn't recommend for everyone like that's that's a hard way to justify um shared ftes but on the other hand, you know, that is part of the way the curriculum is built is like its scalability is a big part of it. Um, fantastic. Yeah, UCSD is doing the same thing, by the way, too. Sharing okay. FTEs by scaling up. And oh. I have similar thoughts as Eric on it. <laughs> yeah. Okay, this is fantastic. What a great panel. Um, we have a new member. Her first time at the workshop. Welcome, Judith. Hi. Well, I mean, I was here last year. But <laughs> you were here last year, but like first yeah. time as like a coming back. As, <laughs> yes, first time coming back. Um, can everybody see my uh, presentation? Yeah. Great. All right. Put that in full. Still good? OK. <laughs> All right. So yeah, so my name is Judith Kanner. I am, um, if you know, if we were actually in Berkeley, I would have just been a couple hour drive south. It is foggy out here as it is in the summer um, in Monterey Bay. Um, and I'm in the Department of Math and Statistics and I do statistics, but my background's pretty interdisciplinary. <laughs> um, and so I'm always looking for those intersections. Um, so what I wanted to share first was a little bit about our institution because um, you know, we've heard from Fresno, we've heard from Cal Poly, but they are, um, Cal Poly, first of all, is 20,000 something students. Fresno, I think, is like 30 or 40. It's, they're big institutions. We are a tiny little CSU. We're only 25 years old. Um, we have just over 7,000 students. We are classified as a Hispanic serving institution. Um, very similar to Fresno, we have a high proportion of first generation, low income and underrepresented um, students. Um, and so we do serve a very diverse population, um, not just from our service area, which is the three counties around us, but um, we actually get a lot of students from other places, um, mostly interested in marine science, but that's eventually it will be data science, I'm sure. <laughs> Um, and then in uh, 2015, uh, we actually got a grant through the NIH. Um, they had this in big data to knowledge or BD2K program at the time. Um, it's no longer a program at the NIH, but it was to support research programs for undergraduates, curriculum development and faculty development and training. Um, and through that grant, we really started to ramp up our process of developing courses in, in computer science and statistics, which I'm going to focus on, but also in the area of bioinformatics and genomics, um, because we were collaborating with UC Santa Cruz's uh, Genomics Institute for the summer research program. So I'll run you through what we have right now. Um, in the mathematics and statistics department, we have two majors. The statistics major is actually brand new. As of this last year, we elevated a concentration up to a full major um, and so it's just getting started and um, that major just so you know within the context of the CSU system we're only the sixth CSU to have a statistics bachelor's degree there are still some that have concentrations like we did um, and of those six um, we uh, two of them San Diego and San Luis Obispo who are represented here are impacted um, and so we're here ready to take statistics students on <laughs> And to help start training them and we also have had a really really um, robust statistics minor 
Um, I started it when I first came out to CSUMB and it's just grown to be one of the biggest miners on campus. Um, students from across disciplines and we've sort of integrated data science um, as a choice within that minor, um, including a class on statistical computing, data visualization, and then our generalized linear models class, we've integrated supervised and unsupervised um, techniques into that class um, using the Introduction to Statistical Learning book. Um, and uh, so we've had this program going, and one of the great things about the stats minor and this pathway is that we have integrated classes through general education. Um, so introduction to statistics is a general education course, and then in the CSU system we have upper division general education courses, and so data visualization is an upper division general education course as well. So it allows students to really easily add on these um, classes without adding on a lot of extra units. Um, especially for transfer students, most transfer in with introduction to statistics so they can jump right into um, the data visualization course when they get here. Um, and then the other place we've had data science developing is in the School of Computing and Design, um, which has a concentration of data science in their computer science major. Um, and so there's that concentration, but then through the CS minor, we've got it so that um, you can transition through their data science classes. It does require that you go through two semesters of programming before you can get into their introduction to data science class and advanced machine learning class. Um, both of those classes use Python, um, and so it's definitely an introduction for the students to get into that um, if they're just coming up through the minor or through this uh, computer science minor. Um, and if they're in statistics, we are very our loving um, statistics department. Uh, so that's mostly what they're seeing are in SAS right now are what they see in our classrooms. Um, so the great thing about these two minors is stat majors can easily do the computer science minor because they are required already to take programming or so stat majors can do the computer science minor. Computer science majors with the data science concentration easily add on a stats minor. So kind of like what Hunter was talking about with that cross disciplinary um, situation, but it's not really easily accessible for students outside of those two majors to get classes from both programs to really get that robust um, data science education. And so what we're working on right now is a data science minor. Um, the outcomes are based on the annual review of statistics and its applications in data science, data science report. Um, and the stipulations on this minor were that they don't want it to be more than 12 to 15 units. Um, our minors at minimum are 12 units, um, but we, they don't want something that's going to add on more than a whole you know, semester onto a student's education. Um, they really don't want any new courses <laughs> as much as possible. Um, so the current um, structuring, it's going to require some prereq changes, some pathway changes, and also what we're going to be doing is creating a new data science course that will also be an upper division general education course, and it will be loosely modeled on the data eight course. Um, since students will already have had introduction to statistics before they take it, we won't. We can pull out some of the statistics-based modules, and we do simulation-based inference in our introductory statistics classes. Um, but we'll be adding in more of the computation um, and computing side of things um, into that class, because in their general education intro stat course, um, they only see JMP or jump. Um, uh, so those are some of the things that we're working on right now. And the goal is to have this major agnostic, if you will, data science minor, any student can access, um, any student can take, minimizing as many units as they need uh, to get at least that 12 unit minimum um, to, and no more than 15. And it looks like it's doable. Um, <laughs> so we'll be proposing this officially in the fall um, with the hopeful implementation date of fall 2021. But I also wanted to touch on a few other things we're doing around data science on our campus that I think are really important to keep in mind. I mentioned our summer research experience. That program is actually in its last summer um, through funding through the NIH. And because the BD2K program doesn't exist, there's no possibility for extension. But that really has created for us a community college to CSU to UC pipeline where we have students who are going up to UC Santa Cruz doing summer research, and then they're going up to UC Santa Cruz and doing their master's and their PhDs there. There. And so that's something that's so valuable to getting students experience outside of their own um, and internships would be another piece of this, but that research experience 
um, and connection to the UCs, especially for us, UC Santa Cruz has been really valuable. And it's paid. That's very important for our students. <laughs> The other thing we are doing is realizing we can't serve all students through research experiences in the summer. So we've been really trying to integrate in every single one of our data science, statistics, computer science courses, uh, what we what are called course based undergraduate research experiences. So these are real research experiences. So they're going to be dealing with real data or real problem um, and doing something that's real, uh, whether writing a paper, doing an oral presentation, consulting with an organization. Um, or doing just a whole research project in our capstone class um, where they're doing original research and are able to build up a portfolio of experiences by the time they graduate so that they have that to share with future employers. The other side of data science um, that maybe hasn't been discussed yet is that professional development side. Uh, for a lot of our students coming in, they aren't necessarily, especially our first generation students, they just don't have the influence um, that some of our students have about how to prepare, what they need to be doing to prepare for a career, whether that's going on to grad school or going into industry directly after their undergraduate degree. So right now we have a third year professional seminar that's required where they do career exploration, they develop a four semester plan, work on their communication skills, both oral um, and written. Um, and so that's really something that impacts all students. And um, I'm doing a pilot program this fall uh, where we're doing a prep uh, class for students to prepare for applications for graduate school for master's and PhD programs. Um, so that's this year and then hopefully the year after we're going to be offering a career prep class, which helps them do things like get their resumes in line, help them make contacts, think about networking, e-portfolios, things like that to help connect to industry. Um, but I think thinking about the professional development side of things and preparing our students not just with the data science skills, but what are often called soft skills, but really are necessary skills for success um, and really trying to develop those in our uh, students. And then the last thing I just wanted to highlight, maybe a good segue into a broader conversation is um, in the CSU system, there's a program called C Superb, which is a, a program for education and research in biotechnology. Um, and two of my um, uh, two colleagues, one at my institution, Dr. Nate Ju and um, Dr. Dr. Maury Barzak, who's at Humboldt State, did a survey of CSU, uh, mostly STEM programs, asking about computational needs. Um, this is just a clip of the report, and I've linked the full report in my slides as well. Um, but to really advance um, data science and computational sciences more broadly in the CSUs, especially for small institutions like mine, we need to start thinking about how to get access to that big data computation type resources, like whether it's Amazon Web Services or maybe something hosted within the CSU or maybe a joint CSU UC CC venture, um, something that really um, gives that access to computational resources. Uh, because our students don't always have the computing power on their own personal computer. Um, in fact, a lot of them have Chromebooks, um, but you know, Johns Hopkins has been doing a training program using data science on a Chromebook, um, using web-based services, and so there's definitely models out there that we could look into. Um, Jupyter Notebooks is a great example, um, but there is a scalability issue with really getting into those more advanced big data type um, computational uh, needs and trainings, not just for students, but also for faculty. And that also impacts research for faculty. Um, so I'll end with, there's my contact information, uh, email, the webpage for our Big Data to Knowledge program, and then I'm on Twitter, so feel free to follow me. Um, and then I've also put a paper that I wrote a few years ago with some other PIs on the same NIH grant who are other minority serving institutions. Um, who had a similar program and just and it's a little dated, it's a few years old, but gives some recommendations for thinking about really how to enhance diversity in biomedical data science. Wow. wow. Awesome. awesome. So, glad so glad to have you. To have you. Thank you for having me. <laughs> um, on the last note, I am super interested in this discussion of, you know, how to make scalable infrastructure. We have a bunch of people at this meeting on this call that are the right people. 
Um, certainly the next workshop uh, panel right after this is uh, is a bunch of people that are the behind the scenes Jupiter Hub supporters that are the people that sort of could open the key to this. Um, there's a there's a couple initiatives that I need to just quickly put out there and they'll be on Friday or whatever. There's one that's called 2I2C. The Canadians have a model where there's like a single Google sign in for 15 different universities in Canada. Canada is a little ahead of us in the socialism department, but California is not that far behind. We could totally have what they have. Uh, the person who built the Canadian model wants to like work with California. There's people at Berkeley that want to do it. Um, so I think we'll be building that out this year and, um, you know, looking for partnerships. It's the idea there is it's sort of a hybrid private public model where like there's a public university angle to it, but it's sort of run like a business, you know, just to be more efficient and not be like university IT infrastructure, you know, like to try and be more flexible. Um, I there's another one that you may know about. There's an NSF project called Cloud Bank at uh, San Diego Supercomputer. And Berkeley has a partnership on that for educational outreach. And the idea there is that they're going to have some ways to get really cheap access to cloud. Like they are going to bargain with the big vendors so that the cloud prices are re reduced by buying in bulk. And there'll be like a special window where we can go access cloud credits cheaper. Our idea there is like, let's build the Jupyter Hub, let's get them to access the cloud and let's have some sort of client portal uh, for that. Part of my vision organizationally is I think that the CS, I mean, I'm, I'm not super articulate on this, but I think that this, there could be a vision of like, how could we get CSU to make a, a cross CSU play? You know, like a CSU wide infrastructure, you know, is there somebody that, at CSU level that could take this on and be the partner leading the portal, um, you know, helping with the single sign on and stuff. I w I'll just jump in and say there has been a there was a panel. Um, I wasn't there, but my colleague Nate Jew was, um, organized it um, with the NSF program director for cyber infrastructure, who's now a dean at Fresno um, and folks with um, who do large cluster facilities in Florida, the CTO for IBM in California, um, and also the vice chancellor of research at CSU. And they came up with a couple possible models of a CSU owned and managed model, a cloud outsourced version, or maybe some sort of hybrid model. And so that has been discussed. Okay, I would love to get those contacts and be part of that conversation. Um, Lots of fun stuff to build. Uh, do we want to look through the chat? Um, there is a question hello. for Judith Kenner. Question for Judith about the Johns Hopkins program. Sorry, my um, mute screen wasn't coming on. Um, yeah, I'll post a, I'll get up the link and post it in the chat for you. Um, but yeah, John Hopkins, um, John, they, um, it was actually an outreach program to a local organization where they basically put everything in a cloud-based service, gave um, Chromebooks. These were to people who were getting their GEDs. Um, and it was through the city of Baltimore. And so they got their GED and then did this data science training course using a Chromebook. Um, and so we use the RStudio server. Um, so that actually makes it doable, which also hosts Jupyter Notebooks now and integrates Python. Um, and RStudio server is free to academic institutions. And so that's a big win for our students because they don't always have, if they have a Chromebook, they can't download R in RStudio easily. Yep. So it gives them a server-based um, method for accessing it. But I'll put a link in in a second. Great, and it's super funny because there's also a presentation Friday from our implementation of Jupyter Hub, where Jupyter Hub can serve our studio. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, um, 
everyone at Berkeley has our studio through Jupiter Hub. Many people don't know that, but <laughs> uh, I guess there's some questions in here about data eight to data 100, like what about including data 100 stuff in data eight, or what about including like catching people up to the data 100 level? Um, and I, I definitely want to mention to Solomon, if you one of your questions was, what's the next thing? Um, there's, lot, there's lots of students that I work with will say that Data 100 is their favorite class at Berkeley. Um, yeah. Yeah, I think uh, that what's doable and what's appropriate for community colleges. Um, and yeah, I'm definitely interested in Data 100. Yeah. I do also, I am curious and I want to second um, Catherine's question about how to find space or how to actually integrate human ethics, um, human context and ethics into the courses. Um, personally, I've been struggling with that and not in terms of where to do this, but about how to properly lead the discussion in the class because I do not have the training um, in carefully managing those discussions. And last time we did it, actually every time we do it, there is one or two comments that open up a can of worms that needs to be addressed, that it has to be a conversation. I just don't feel like I'm qualified to do that. Um, and so I'm, I'm super curious how everybody um, is doing that in their classrooms. Uh, um, I, I wouldn't mind uh, giving my experience since this was actually something I didn't get to talk about on the, the HCE panel yesterday. Um, so I, I, I mostly teach what I was calling calling like the holistic data science courses, kind of like data eight or our version of data 100 um, in the capstone. Um, and I have, I, I make sure to put in both in lectures as well as in the projects, various, you know, um, uh, you know, you know, human context and ethics uh, topics. And one thing that to sort of echo what you were saying, um, one thing that's really a challenge, right, um, is, uh, you know, so I try to, um, you know, students, you have to have some understanding, right, of, of social structures in order to identify them in data and reason about them in data. And we get, in these technical courses, you get a bunch of students uh, with just a huge variety of backgrounds in that step one of, like, what their understandings are and where they're coming from. Um, and so being able, it's, it's hard to like, you, you can't assume that there is this, what uh, uh, Professor Noble said yesterday, that you have this scaffolding that you can build up for everybody to be on the same level. Um, so one way that I've approached this, um, which is very imperfect, and I often feel like I'm like kind of fumbling around in the dark like you, um, is to kind of use Empathy is a stand-in, um, and my sort of go-to examples uh, are, you know, make things as relatable as possible and in encourage this discussion, even if it has the potential to, you know, kind of go sideways. Um, and uh, I really focus on examples that are either on students' own data or things that they can verify, right? So if Google does something creepy, uh, for example, and you can actually see that they're doing this by hitting an API, um, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll do that. Or I have a project where students will look at, use actually their own location data, and you actually can see how much you can tell about a person uh, by doing a data analysis on their location data. And then with some, you know, leading questions or whatnot, um, and uh, and then to make you know there's a lot of different cultures and and a lot of different perspectives when when analyzing this you know uh, you know answering these questions um, I will often really like try to lean on on peer review and just or actually group either group projects where they can discuss these things um, or uh, peer review as well um, with with students to kind of start conversations and then you can kind of follow along and you know do your best 
right, to, to, to mediate. I'll I'll jump in quick here and just say we we do a lot with um, these kind of conversations, which I think are so I was so glad to see Safia Noble. She's spoken at our use on your on this workshops um, uh, list of speakers because uh, she spoke at our university. But I mean, especially right now, I don't know if people all saw all about the person who was falsely arrested because an algorithm identified him. Um, and just the bias that are in algorithms. And, and so we have a whole class built around both consulting and um, service. Uh, so they consult with nonprofits and within the class, we then discuss ethics and um, ideas of equity and social justice. And we use the book right now, um, Weapons of Math Destruction, because it's pretty accessible to any student, no matter what background they're coming from. Um, but uh, one of the things that we do to help within those conversations around ethics, especially around things that might be very sensitive um, or even potentially political, is a technique called the LARA or the LARA method. And I can send you a podcast. Um, it's it's listen. Um, so you're listening first. You affirm things, right? Um, you respond um, and then you add, right? So it's and I may have messed up a few words, but the idea, it's a framework and we have the students actually practice the framework with different um, scenarios and things like that so that they can learn a way to really productively hold conversations with each other around these potentially touchy issues related to ethics, um, but also things like equity and social justice. Um, and so I'm happy to share, we actually have a paper we wrote about the class and I'm happy to share that with anybody who's interested. Awesome. Yeah, it's been an interesting uh, effort for us recently trying to get curriculum built to just sort of make sure that in those core like 100, 102, there are places for the challenges that Aaron's bringing up, um, you know, that, that they'll be prompted in the curriculum by by having the right having the right materials ready. Yeah, that was actually one of the comments that our faculty gave us when they looked over our Data 100 course and they're like, wait a minute, why is there no lecture on uh, ethics or privacy? And we said, well, you know what, we don't delegate it for to just one lecture. It's woven throughout all of the examples. We kind of, you know, what are the principles of measurement? Who is left out? Who is not represented? Um, but once in a while, and especially towards the end of this quarter, the issues around police were very, very relevant. And we just felt that it would be a miss, like if we don't introduce it in the class, but at the same time, it is such a hot topic and it's such a sensitive topic. And so we were just, you know, kind of gently trying to show the issues that, you know, there have been problems. This is the statistics. Um, and something else that I'm very curious about, and I, you know, we can continue this conversation. Hopefully the recording is there so anybody can send this to me. But one of the things that um, I like to do in my class, especially when I bring up the ethics um, or human context is, to not just present this grim scenario and just leave it as that, like, look how terrible this is. I like to give students a way out and be like, this is how you can be the change. This is what you can keep in mind. So I've brought up the pay inequity a lot in my class to show that women just by default, by the, being a woman, you start at a lower salary. And then I remind them that, you know, you will be managers, you will be hiring teams. You need to make sure that there is transparency. You need to make sure that you have diverse teams. You need, so like, these are kind of the, the things that I know, that I know that they can do. But with all of the other issues, I'm just like, how, how do we com combat police brutality? I don't know at what can I as a citizen do? But that is something I think if we can put this together in terms of like what what is the power that students have as the builders of our society that is I think would be crucial to add in addition to the discussion of this. Excellent. 
Um, if I can, I would just love to just touch on another topic that's like, how do you sort of move things around your university? Like a lot of this is like, let's start with data eight. Let's start with our little class in RCS or stats. But there is this like, you know, certainly for Hunter, like, how can I get the rest of the people in the stats department interested that are teaching 27 different sections of stat one, you know, or um, how can I sort of, you know, in your Ty's case, we're like, I'm going to teach my data science over here, but the math department's still going to keep doing what they're doing. And like, how do I build those bridges at my different campuses to get other people engaged that like, this is a refresh, you know, like, let's not teach stats like it's 1975. Like, let's, you know, there's lots of places that these techniques can be used to upgrade lots of people's classes. Yeah, it's, it's actually kind of funny. Um, I, I think I'm, I, I'm, I'm maybe still a little bit spoiled here because the, the resistance is, is maybe um, uh, specific to like notebooks and newer interfaces and stuff like that, and and less so to the the curriculum. I mean, we've, all of our interest classes in statistics have been doing, you know, simulation based and randomization based stuff for years and years and years and and everything. Um, and I think our our faculty are our um, our statistics faculty are very much in favor of using using software, being hands on. And the fact that our campus is already kind of bought into introductory statistics on a very, very broad level, um, yeah. it's it's really just um, communicating with all of our client departments, right? And figuring out, you know, how how does intro data science meet the statistical needs that you've had for so long, and you know, how much do you prefer that over what you're getting right now out of your statistical content? And so um, it's really helped build. A uh, campus conversation that um, had kind of, uh, to my to my knowledge, because I'm I'm still young as far as the university is concerned, I guess. But it, it feels like it had stagnated a little bit. But it's been a really great kind of centralizing conversation and bringing everybody back together to talk about all these skills and and things that everybody on campus is using. So, yeah. E in my case, uh, uh, so we uh, like in the Berkeley case, we we wanted to have this course to open to everyone. Like other stat classes or programming classes, they are specific to their uh, majors and programs. Um, so to set the tone in the beginning, uh, as Eric mentioned in the beginning, I invited him last year during October. Right uh, uh, to our campus to present about this initiative, right? The data aid and how they are doing, and uh, uh, we invited uh, all the faculty members, department chairs, uh, uh, and the uh, across the campus, not only one one school or or, or college, and that's that's the. There was starting point, so people showed up uh, from different departments, and then they they appreciated the value how how it's done there, and we should be uh, working in a similar uh, fashion. Uh, and then uh, we started formally putting the uh, course, and then uh, you know uh, putting in the uh, committees like you know department committee, college and university GE committee. Uh, because it was known for those higher level, at the higher level, most of the faculty members and the, uh, and the department chairs, they, it was okay in most cases, but the only thing uh, we had a little bit resistance was uh, at the uh, at the uh, GE level, uh, because like, like you mentioned, right, some GE courses are basically bread and butter of for some departments, and uh, they were, uh, uh, you know, concerned that their FD might go go away. Like if if you if there's another additional course, uh, students are enrolling different one. But uh, we 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 be, I mean, uh, like you say, we 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 said, you know, this is this is not going to replace any course uh, at the moment. <laughs> uh, 
uh, it's only for the interested students right now. Uh, and uh, even at the GE level, some degrees require specific GE courses. But in this, this course is not specific to any department. Um, so overall, the, the uh, impact would be, uh, you know, not, not so much. Uh, and it's a new thing, like uh, it's uh, instead of teaching, you know, tra traditional STAT or computer science, like like you mentioned, like some students either shy away if it's if it is CS or if it's uh, totally STAT. They 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 only the students in that majors like the would take the course. But in this case, uh, we try to, to focus on the uh, it's going to be. Uh, open for everyone at the at the lower level. Great. Solomon. Great. Yeah, um, so I can speak specifically to that at the community college level, obviously. Um, so it wasn't, uh, there was no resistance from the math faculty um, just because of what I mentioned with AB 705 and there being a lot of changes in the number of courses that we offer, especially at the developmental level. Um, there were a lot of uh, math faculty that uh, expressed expressed interest. Um, the getting of the uh, data eight course, the RCS eight course uh, through uh, curriculum um, was pretty straightforward. Um, as I have thought about it, we have had um, some of these issues you talked about with different departments and FTEs, and I could, uh, it's, it's not hard for me to imagine that if we tried to offer another class uh, that had a database component, that we would start to run in some issues uh, with other, um, um, other places. I think the way that I've kind of approached it is to um, make sure that when I've talked to administrators and I've gotten reinforcement to administrators, that I'm not just um, talking about one class, but I'm really just talking about the whole field and what where this can go. So it's a lot easier to um, to argue or to throw up roadblocks when it's just one independent class. But um, if I can voice this in a way of this being a program that we're offering um, that's really to the benefit of students, I think that that makes my argument. Um, and it makes it starts to make things easier. And um, talking to administrators about this and just putting, uh, you know, I've had I've had a student, I told a student, go go talk to the vice president and then just just tell them how much you want data science and, and why you've had to go different places for that. And I think that that is going to make it easier if those those discussions and if those roadblocks come up in the future. Uh, I would love to um, just sum up a little bit. I'm going to have to jump out because shocker, I'm moderating the next panel. <laughs> um, but I will just want to talk for a couple minutes and then I'll leave you guys in the call if you want to keep chatting or keep 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 talking to the um, whoever's on chat or whatever. Um, I just want to say this is awesome. I really have a vision that we can sort of create a community of practice, support each other. There's some people with more resources. There's some people with less resources. We're connected by these flows of students and thousands of students are going between our institutions. Um, we're connected by this curriculum. Uh, you know, Aaron's making a fork of the you know, baby pandas. Kate's got the idea of like, we're making new homeworks and new labs that reference our cafes or our sports teams. I, Kate, this came up on the adoption panel uh, yesterday, and I definitely want to make the open repo of like different people's homework seven and different people's lab two. And it's, you know, it's a cool idea that could still fit in the same scaffolding, but have other data sets. I, you know, I love that idea. I definitely want to operationalize that going forward. But you know, we have this idea for California strategy, like let's make some way that we're a community of practice. We can be on the Slack answering each other's questions and helping the next people to come along. Uh, but potentially we could also be an advocacy group like fundraising into the space or, um, you know, going to the CIO of uh, CSU, you know, like advocating at that level, like because we have some coordination of curriculum and we have like 
a huge number of students impacted like that would be one thing it just like show the number of students that are that are leaning into this study area um to be like you know we're a future field and like help back us up with resources i'll say i'll just say us at uc berkeley we're very interested in providing infrastructural possibilities for the future like you know it's all an open source stack and we have a vision of the open source infrastructure going forward I think that you can look in the slat in in the chat for this. The HCE people they want to build curriculum into this space and share their curriculum into this space just the way that we've been sharing the original materials. Uh, it's a great project that you know as people are collaborating and sharing, you know that's what makes it strong and that's what makes it you know have have legs into the future. Thanks everybody. Um, I'm going to jump off to go to the next panel. That's the people that support us with infrastructure, but you guys are welcome to stay in here. And if somebody just look through the chat, I don't know if you want to just check out if there's anything to answer for people. A lot of people are answering each other's questions in the chat yeah. as it works, but um, yeah. you thank you very it. much, Eric. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Eric. Thanks, Eric. Is the chat going to be here for this? Yeah. Okay, so we can come back to yeah. it later yeah. as well. Okay. Yeah. I'm like, there's so many good links, yeah. but yeah. yeah. Yeah, I know. I was just going through it too. Um. Yeah, so I think I have to leave as well, but I just wanted to end with yeah. my email and Twitter handle is there as well, um, similar mm -hmm. to maybe Judith. So in addition to the Slack, I'm happy to to communicate and continue working together and everything like that. So yeah, thank you all very much. Yeah, Thanks nice. for sharing. Thank you. Thank you. I guess I should say too that uh, like UCSD, we've taught data now like for two every quarter for two years uh, or more, um, mm -hmm. and have rebuilt assignments numerous times now, like three or four times. Um, and um, <clears throat> as Eric said, we actually were, were were sort of forking the idea. We love the spirit of the class, but we're creating mm -hmm. our own textbook uh, that should be finished by the end of the summer. Um, mm -hmm. And so any of these sorts of resources, people should feel free to like reach out and we're happy to share. Mm -hmm. um, and then we have a similar-ish to Data 100. Um, it's our DSC 80, but is actually quite different when you actually teach it. Um, it's a lot more like uh, data eight, but with messy data um, mm -hmm. um, and a little less survey, uh, a little more hands dirty. And um, there's a rough textbook which should get polished up a bit better um, this summer, but it, it, that the textbook and page is linked in the chat as well. Um, and if any of that stuff's interesting to anybody, that you should reach out to us. Oh, why? Yeah. <laughs> oh, so the date. There's a question in chat of why do we feel like we need to recreate a textbook? Um, and so for for data eight, um, part of it is so so actually the main reason is the data science module, <laughs> um, and. Uh -huh. The other reason is, uh, it, so we want to use pandas instead of the data science module. Um, but we like aspects of the data science module. Um, and uh, so what we did was kind of create a version of pandas that has a restricted API um, so that you can't kind of, you have to conform to best practices, um, but it's still runnable Python pandas code. Um, and there's a link to that project in the chat, um, but we can't just the 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 data like as, as Kate was saying the the data textbook is like so tight, right? That you you pull one thing out and it kind of falls apart a bit. 
Um, and you really can't take away the data science module out of it. Um, so that's why we're writing our own book. Um, it has our own flourishes, like it's, it's the introductory course to our major, um, as opposed to being like a course for the campus. Um, so it goes through a little bit of Python fundamentals and stuff like that as well. Um, but but th that's the main reason. Um, actually, if, if we didn't have licensing issues, we would just slightly tweak it because it's an amazing textbook. <laughs> Yeah, we fought, we brought it up <laughs> yeah. several yep. times, but uh, yeah, if, um, hopefully your textbook will not have that licensing issue because. No, yeah, and actually my data, my version is not data 100 at all, but my DSC 80 is, is MIT uh, licensed mm -hmm. and you can change it however you would like. Mm -hmm. um, I think also something with the materials and th that happened the way when I adopted it um, and started making changes, I realized that we have the permission from Berkeley to use the materials to bring it into our classroom. Um, but then there was no acknowledgement even. And I, I think maybe having something standardized where it's like, oh, this was taken from here to there. because. I also know that you know some materials that we find come from other institutions. So I think having the model of like, how do you cite it? Where do you cite it? Where do you put those acknowledgements? Um, this is what I'm hoping through this portal of like saying that these are the different modules and this is the type of acknowledgement you can leave would be helpful. Um, but yeah, I'm excited to try out this baby pandas and mm -hmm. see how it how it goes. I uh, I remember that was a discussion last year, a big discussion with people saying that, you know, why would you give them these training wheels? Why don't we just directly do it? Um, so I'm curious to hear what is the main difference between like the so data science package introduces its own syntax. You're saying that baby pandas. Um, is a simplified panda. So what are the simplifications? If you can just like do a summary, maybe. Okay, <laughs> leaving <Yeah>. Judy. <laughs> it's good to see you. <laughs> um, the, uh, so so I, I, I put a PowerPoint or, or a Google Slides in, in the chat that I was originally going to give a lightning talk, but it was on two panels, so shouldn't be giving a lightning talk. Um, <laughs> um, but it kind of goes through it, but um, basically, like data science, like pedagogically, the data science module is really good, right? And John De Niro, like, made a very thoughtful, um, uh, you know, library. And what I really liked from it, for example, is it, it, it prioritizes copies over views and in-place modification. Like Pandas has, is this disgusting hybrid um, between um, uh, like MATLAB and SQL, basically. Um, and it kind of takes just the SQL part and, you know, kind of focuses on tabular manipulation. Mm -hmm. um, so that's the one thing that, that it does that I wanted to keep in, in pandas, in baby pandas. And mm -hmm. so basically like a lot of the in-place MATLAB operations type operations in pandas, uh, baby pandas, I, I, I make that inaccessible. So you can't like modify a data frame in place, everything returns a copy. Um, mm -hmm. So I tried to keep that. The other side of pandas, which is really nice, is what Aniyad Kari likes to talk about of like that there it's not ugly and it's not scary to someone who's never coded before. Mm -hmm. um, and so it doesn't have to, like the defaults are all beautiful for the course. You rarely have to like um, mess with arguments in, in weird ways, things like that. And in order for it to keep everything valid pandas code, you can't get away from having like, uh, indices on a data frame, for example, or named arguments, um, mm -hmm. keyword arguments. Um, and so it's a little uglier um, than the data science module, and it looks a little more scary mm -hmm. and requires a little more hand-holding at first. I see. Okay. Yeah, yeah because I think that's the, the lack of those brackets is what sold me on the data science module. And then I found a transition from students to real data science tools wasn't as um, as scary. But yeah, I, I'll look into it and see. Oh. Yeah, and that was like, I tried really hard and it's basically impossible to keep square brackets out of it. Um, mm -hmm. But on the other hand, 
if it's the first course in many and you make this the starting assumption that everybody will be moving on to pandas or yeah. something similar next in the next quarter um, or at, you know that's a desire they want out of it then it, it at least gives best practices for using pandas right um, as opposed to like tutorials out there which are just terrible right so yeah. that was that was the idea I just saw the Alara's question for all of you who have been teaching data eight. How many instructors do you have at your institution that can teach the course? Uh, and it's a great question because at least for me at the moment, I'm the only one I think able and willing. Um, and this is why I'm so eager to help other people just to see which aspects of it people need more help with. But Aaron, you have more people. Yeah. That's, uh, I mean, I like to say that, and I don't know, I mean, well, we still have a few. Um, uh, it, it's accessible to high school prerequisites, right? Um, and so I use that to try to browbeat anybody in a STEM field um, into teaching it. And actually, when we're hiring new faculty, it's a requirement in our department that you have to teach data eight. Um, and if you've never coded before, it's like, you know, they haven't either, you, you can figure it out. Um, that it's a hard sell, um, but it, it, it's, it's really like, I mean, we try to, we try to make that argument positively, honestly, and like a lot of people actually embrace it and, and, are, and are willing, surprising number are really willing to like learn a bit of Python. We typically will like, we would, for example, like co-teach for the first time, right? To get, you know, I would say the most scary thing about data eight is all the services involved in like auto, you know, the okay pie and like, you know, the notebooks and stuff. And that like, we try to pair an experienced instructor with a non-experienced instructor and then all of a sudden they're experienced, right? Mm -hmm. um, and that's worked pretty well. Um, but yeah, um, and, <laughs> and then the more advanced ones like data 100, like you're, so far, it's like I train them or I teach them, right? Like, um, um, and that that's been a little more painful. Like when you start getting more advanced, advanced material that m mixes math and coding, right? Yeah. Um, so, and I think the scary part um, for the instructors, at least, it's not the presentation of the material. So if, if all they had to do is to just go through these materials and elaborate on the materials themselves, we would have, I think, a lot more people on board. I think what people are really scared of is debugging. Like when they come to me with a question and the debugging also of the statistical concepts, right? I see this with the CS faculty who are like bootstrapping and, you know, the confidence intervals and all of this. Like I haven't taken this since my undergrad. Um, versus the test faculty who are like, wait, Python, how does, why is, why aren't we using R and this kinds of things? So um, I think there's just the scary part of like, how do I troubleshoot? Um, but in terms of the material, I think it's pretty straightforward. Yeah. I, I uh, another comment just about the data sets and like, you know, uh, in, in being very U.S. relevant and not, you know, relevant to the rest of the world. Um, it's funny because, right, Kate, you mentioned that it, you even had that, I mean, I do too, right? Like, you know, if you're at UCSB or UCSD um, and, and you see all these Berkeley examples, like, I find them cute because I went to Berkeley, but my students are kind of like, you know, or, you know, <laughs> um, but they're also like, would just, totally missed the mark like you know in a, in a you know to very different area um and i remember like david Culler saying that like probably the hardest part about creating like working on the data eight textbook was coming up with good examples um and good data sets and i have to say putting together this book for my uh you know intermediate level data eight type course the <laughs> the data finding the data sets are are definitely like the hardest part. Um, and especially if you wanna do things like make them feel relevant to like a diverse group of students, right? Like this is a great place to like insert human context and ethics into the into the course as well. Um, and 
I totally, uh, totally agree that it would be nice to, um, it would be really nice to have, uh, you know, a repo of data sets. Um, I have a few, I'll, I'll dig them up and I'll put them in this chat. Um, but there are some, right, data, uh, data are plural, like uh, that mm -hmm. book actually has an archive of data sets that are like, that, that's like, I don't know, there's, there's 500, like 500 over examples, yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. That's a great resource. There's a bunch. There, there's a bunch of really nice resources out there. Um, I guess I'm lucky enough to have a data librarian that helps helps me find some of this stuff. So um, actually, something that I found with that with the data sets themselves is like, like you said, getting the data. But I'm as you are talking about your experience, Aaron. How do you? do the insight part because that is the part that usually i get uh, stumbled on because now i think it's becoming easier to you know clean up the data and put it in different formats so this past spring i found that oh there are actually lots of data sets but now it's up to me to sit down and spend two hours to realize that I can't actually give this because it doesn't have the insight that I was either hoping for or needed in order to use it as part of the lecture. So what do you do with that? Um, to, to, the non-useful answer to that was that I worked as a data scientist for like okay. five years, right? Um, and used to do it full time. And so I'm very fast. Um, but uh, honestly, like especially data one, like if a student is to, like the, Tutors, right? The tutor army that Berkeley has built. We kind of have have something similar. Um, those those sen juniors and seniors that have taken Data Eight have maybe taken your version of Data One Hundred, or just like really into going through and doing like even like Kaggle exercises, uh, you know, competitions and stuff like that. Um, which is another reasonable place actually to look for data sets is the Kaggle data sets. Um, I will actually often have them uh, tutors do. In like kind of uh, in EDA, basically a preliminary EDA on on data sets that they find interesting, and then I'll look through their EDA and be like, oh, well, that looks neat or something like that, and I'll use that as a starting point, um, and then have them turn around and and maybe do a little more on it. Um, so I try to use like advanced students to do some of that legwork for me. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's. That's a good idea. But yeah, I, I I see the comment that like Utah students, you know, South yeah. African students, it's really hard to connect. And um, I'm actually curious, maybe if those people are still in the chat, what sort of examples would the students be able to connect with? Like what okay. would be relevant? And I'm also curious if like, can guests, are guests able to unmute or are you not? They should be able to, yeah. At least earlier, we had a conversation. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Yes, it's Paul here from South Africa. Cool. Um, so yes, um, it is, uh, of course, the data sets that's going to be in data aid and so forth will be from the US. That does make sense. But you can imagine that people here in South Africa, we don't know about California jury selection problems, yeah. um, things like that. So that's where it becomes difficult to um, find data sets that the students will relate to. Also, of course, in South Africa, we are very diverse in culture, so you have to be careful. Um, I found excellent data sets, and then one of the main variables is white or not. You cannot mm -hmm. use that. Mm -hmm. Absolutely not. I understand why it's in the data set, because it's relevant to what they have in the rest of the data, but it's not something we can use. So, yeah, it is a bit problematic, but... Um, yeah, we get by. We have other problems as well um, that if you find maybe a data set that's nice, but it's not built into some, we're going to use R, we're not using uh, Python. Uh -huh. If it's not inside a package and not all students have all the time a device, so they must be able to do it sometime online. And some of the online servers don't want to have data um, like um, from text files to Excel files imported. It must be in a in a package. So if it's not in a package already, then you can also not use it. So even if you find a nice data set, it's not always usable in that sense. So, yeah. Nice. But great, great uh, panel. I really enjoyed it. Kat, I did send you an email about please um, sending me your slides if you can. Yeah. Um.
I'm going to mute myself again. Okay, thank you. Thank Thanks. You. That's yeah. useful. Yeah. I actually, there was a, um, I think it's a ProPublica article that um, I wanted to bring in as an example. It's just I didn't get to process the data sets since it was Excel and images and everything. But they actually looked at soccer, um, football in the rest of the world, and looked to see whether or not the color, the skin color of a player um, is correlated to how many red cards they get by the referees. Um, and they did find that, so they actually had different teams of experts look at this data set and code it and do the analysis on it. Um, so that's one example that um, sort of, you know, international soccer and I'm like, you know, maybe better than basketball that I think is very, very prevalent in Berkeley's examples that I couldn't relate to. So, but yeah. There's also the, the, the argument of like, should we expose students to these things that they don't naturally care about? Oh, that, yeah. Actually, that, that I'm curious to, like, so, so what I've experienced with this capstone run, like developing this capstone sequence for everybody, um, we have, uh, uh, we have, for example, like a, you know, the, this coming, so, so what I've, I've done is kind of like, um, I focus, um, I, students pick projects within domains, um, basically, because we have, you know, 250 students. Um, and so basically, we split them into, I find a, a faculty mentor for a domain, or, or an industry mentor. Uh, and we have 14 different domains this coming quarter. And then each one has like about, or no, we have 16. Each one has about 18 students. And then so that supports like, uh, you know, five, five-ish projects, each one. Mm -hmm. um, but students really want to get into the certain domains that maybe look popular and things like that. Um, and they get really like sad when they can't get into like their preferred, you know, area. They're like, I'm going to spend two quarters on this or whatever. Um, and I feel, you know, I like to tell them, you know, like even, you know, you look at anything close enough and it's interesting. Mm -hmm. And as a data scientist, you're supposed to be able to be this like sort of shape shift, shape shifter and like move between domains with your statistical toolkit and your computational toolkit. Mm -hmm. um, and that you should like really embrace looking at, you know, a, a variety of, you know, like problems and data coming from different data generation processes. Right. Um, and, you know, it just gives you kind of like wider exposure to like a variety of problems. Um, and, you know, sometimes students are like begrudgingly, oh, OK, like, you know, um, but I feel like once they actually do it and they get into a data set, even if they didn't think it was interesting or a problem, they didn't think it was interesting originally, like usually they 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 actually do find it rewarding. Right. Um, mm -hmm. So I, I don't know, I really like even. You know, you don't, that, that's why, like, you don't want everything to be basketball, right? But, like, yeah. having one, one example of be basketball is okay, right? Yeah. Yeah, we, actually, in our class, um, so my co-teacher, Alex Franks, he's, area of expertise is, like, basketball analytics, and he starts it out with this really nice visualization of where the shots are being made from. Yeah. And you can basically see that whole outline. So he's like, without even knowing, and he asks specifically students who don't know anything about basketball, what can you tell by looking at this picture? And they're like, well, the spot in the middle is very, very popular. And that's, yeah. that's where the basket is, right? So it's like it kind of tease out almost the rules of the, the game. Rules, yeah. About, yeah. So I, I actually had a student who said exactly that. They were like, I knew nothing about basketball. Like after in the data section, we, we kind of like expanded a project, uh, one of the projects on it once. Um, it was like, I, I knew nothing about basketball. Like, and it was interesting learning the rules from the data. <laughs> That's really cool. Yeah. Well, so, you know, yeah, sometimes it surprises you. Um, <laughs> but yeah. Anyway, I have to... Uh, run to another meeting, but it was, it was everybody. Thank you. you, and Kate. It was yeah. nice to catch up. <laughs> same, same. I hope we'll, we'll 
continue this conversation, definitely. Um, thank you for posting those resources in the Slack channel. You were one of the people that I was like, yes, somebody's yeah. monitoring this when you posted those COVID-19 um, articles. So yeah. keep it up. I'm going to try to create a COVID-19 project for my data, DSC-80, awesome. my, my, my soft, sophomore class next, next, uh, next fall. So I, I've been trying to collect that stuff. Um, nice. I'll, 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 I'll put up some more resources too in the same chat um, so you, and in the Slack channel. I, yeah. I should probably be better about that. So, um, Thank you. Thanks keep for... in touch. Yeah. Same, same. Thank you, right. everybody. Right. Thanks, everyone. Bye.